The Unshackled Waves, episode 97. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company after this huge news week. It's been a shocker for the federal government and we'll dissect it all with Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts in a moment. Our Right Now segment, normally at the beginning of this show, debuted as a standalone daily segment this week. I hope you are enjoying it. So without further ado, let's bring Jacob in. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, good old Tim. Uh, great to be back for another week, and hopefully um, we, we've got a lot to talk about, and hopefully the show goes well. And I'm glad we're recording it uh, on a Friday, uh, so that this show is up to date with well all of the huge news that's uh, come out this week. Let's start with the the High Court uh, rule today on they've been dubbed the, the Citizenship uh, Seven. So the uh, six senators and one lower house MP who had questions over whether they were dual citizens, uh, which whether they were eligible to sit in parliament under section 44 of Australia's constitution. Everyone's been trying to predict which way the high court uh, would go, but in a seven to zero decision, they declared that uh, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, uh, Deputy Nationals, leader Fiona Nash, uh, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts and Green Senators Scott Ludlam and Larissa Waters were all ineligible to sit in Parliament. However, they held that uh, Matt Canavan, who uh, stood aside as a uh, minister, he he was uh, eligible, he didn't hold dual citizenship, and Nick Xenophon was also not found to hold uh, dual citizenship. So he had five out, five out and two in. So it's from my reading of the, the High Court's uh, decision is that they still interpreted Section 44 quite uh, strictly, and it means that potentially more dual citizens, uh, if, if they are in the federal parliament, there's a lot of question marks over, over various MPs, they could be knocked out as well. And that's clearly that the High Court uh, came to the view that uh, ignorance of the law was not an excuse and even though they'd never dealt with uh, citizenship by descent which was the case with Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash they they the High Court still expected those two uh, politicians to do their due diligence and you know find out whether they had inherited uh, citizenship yeah it's interesting I'm I found this uh, this a ruling of the High Court to be quite predictable. I was expecting uh, Joyce, um, Nash, Roberts, Ludlam to all go uh, because ignorance, as you mentioned before, is not an excuse. But the the Canavan and the Xenophon decisions are quite a lot different. For instance, Canavan had no idea uh, that his mother signed him up for an Italian uh, citizenship, and that was very uh, unusual circumstances. And also Xenophon as well, I thought that he was lucky. Um, he renounced his uh, Cypriot citizenship, I believe, but uh, didn't didn't uh, renounce uh, his, his British one that came from uh, Cyprus being a, a British territory at the time. So I found that uh, Xenophon got off lucky, but it doesn't really matter for Xenophon because he is uh, contesting the South Australian state election. Although Canavan uh, is a is a member of cabinet, or I don't know, he might not be anymore, but he was a member of cabinet. And Joyce, and likewise, I believe Nash as well. So these are some really uh, high profile blows for the coalition. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what the result of the New England by-election is. Uh, well, Matt Canavan, he's already been re-sworn in as uh, Cabinet Minister. Ironically, he was the, the only Cabinet Minister who stood aside because, remember, uh, 
uh, Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash, they chose not to stand aside. And uh, Labor, of course, you know, prosecuted in Parliament. You know, how can you know Bar Barnaby Joyce, uh, you know, be making these you know decisions about you know uh, key you know, key areas around agriculture and water when there's a cloud over his uh, uh, eligibility? And the the Turnbull government was really quite you know arrogant in in not. Uh, asking that uh, Joyce and Nash uh, stand aside because from uh, what I've been hearing from the news commentary and constitutional experts that section 40 section 64 of Australia's constitution uh, states that a, a minister can uh, can only only not be a member of uh, parliament for three months before their uh, decisions are found to be invalid. So they've actually been on the math, uh, Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash, they've been cabinet ministers for a whole year when they weren't eligible to be in the parliament. So that could even uh, open to challenge the the, uh, the decisions that they made at ministers for the past year and really uh, put our nation in further political limbo. Well, I think that this is a lesson learned for everyone, regardless of whether you are One Nation or the Greens or the National Party. You have to follow the Constitution. The Constitution is not some um, uh, ancient document that has no relevance to us. It is the very document unto which our country was founded. Uh, and one needs to have respect for the Constitution. Uh, so I really don't have a problem with these decisions that have been made, strict interpretations, yes, but it shows to all that the constitution is a supreme document within the nation and it needs to be respected. And quite frankly, I found it great that the High Court had this courage to make a just and fair decision as they did. Of course, the political fallout from the High Court decision is there'll now be a by-election in the regional New South Wales seat of uh, New England, which uh, Barnaby Joyce uh, held. So at the moment, the uh, the government has uh, lost its uh, one-seat majority, and so I do believe that there's uh, two sitting weeks uh, left before this uh, by-election result is finalised, so uh, Labor will try to cause as much chaos as possible. They probably won't get a no-confidence uh, motion passed because independent Cathy McGowan has said she'll support the government on uh, supply and confidence, but it could... What has been suggested is that Labor and the crossbench and potentially George Christensen could uh, try and get a Royal Commission into the bank's uh, pass. So there's uh, a lot of political instability that, that will follow in the coming months before this uh, by-election is sorted. Now, uh, Tony Windsor, the former member for New England, has said that he's not running, so Barnaby Joyce will most likely uh, win uh, or retain, uh, should I say, uh, New England, but it's, it's certainly going to lead to a few unstable months. Uh, and, and then there's also the possibility of Bob Catter even potentially holding the uh, House of Reps to ransom, you know, asking for um, enumerate things for his uh, northern Queensland uh, constituency. Now, I understand, I, this has slipped my mind, apologies, but there was a Tasmanian senator who held the balance of power in the Senate uh, for quite a while. Brian Do, Harrodine, you yes. Yes. So I'm thinking that uh, Catter could potentially be in a Harrodine-esque situation. Uh, whereby he, you know, asked for right on lawnmowers for everyone in the uh, North Queensland uh, electorate there. So it'd be interesting to see where Bob Catter lies uh, in this in this whole debacle. But uh, I, I view Catter as as as, as an honourable man. Uh, he uh, sided with Abbott before. Uh, there's precedent there. He's an old school national. Uh, he doesn't really want uh, turmoil and chaos. He just wants what's best for his electorate. But certainly, I think that uh, George Christensen would be uh, well within his rights to put, uh, push for a royal commission into the banking sector. Uh, I don't believe that you know more government intervention is the key, but certainly you know elements of uh, monopolisation. What's well, you know the uh, what would you call it a pod? quadruply, yeah, it's a big four, and, and then there's really hard, you know, with the overbearing regulations, uh, they kind of set their own rules. Um, 
the banking sector uh, needs to be looked into a little bit. Uh, I think Christensen's right there. Uh, I don't. I don't think overbearing, you know, government uh, intervention or a royal commission is good. But I th certainly think shining the light uh, toward the banking sector uh, can never hurt. Um, but certainly the ramifications of this uh, are extraordinary, and it, and it just shows that. Uh, well, it just further emphasises the 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 amount of pressure that that uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's under uh, if he can't even keep a majority within the House of Representatives. Now, he lost 13 seats at the last election. Now he doesn't even have a majority. He doesn't have his Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, and it, it's simple that this man is not fit to govern. Uh, and this is all seen through through the chaos and, and uh, how he can't keep his house in order. Well, he's supposed to be flying to Israel tomorrow, and so we do, in his press conference today, he didn't even tell us who the acting Prime Minister would be, who uh, most people assume will be uh, Julie Bishop, which uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, still hasn't confirmed whether he's going on this trip. There, There is this suspicion that he's a bit paranoid to leave Julie Bishop in charge of the country because of you know what, what she might do while he's away. Yeah, well, he yeah, he's, uh, he's not fit to lead. He doesn't have, um, as Andrew Bolt said on the Bolt Report last night, he doesn't have any political vision or any political capability. Um, he He's unfit to, to lead. He's obviously very worried about the stability of his government. And he obviously this leadership issue uh, is further emphasised through him not being able to uh, have the foresight to see who the uh, acting prime minister will be uh, through his trip to Israel. It just shows how chaotic everything's become. Now, I don't really like to stir the pot too much, but it's quite evident that there is a large degree of chaos in Canberra. The week started with news that the Australian Electoral Commission will now list GetUp as an associated uh, entity. This is under pressure from uh, conservatives such as uh, Erica Betts, which will mean that uh, its uh, funding will now be required to be disclosed. Now, uh, GetUp has long been an uh, enemy of the uh, conservative movement. It has campaigned against uh, successfully against conservative politicians such as um, Sophie Mirabella and Andrew Nicoley, and they also want to go after Peter Dutton in the in the next uh, fe federal election. Uh, now, uh, obviously, I don't agree with you know what get up campaigns on the issues that they do, such as you know immigration and climate change. But I think it's a bad move to use the force of government to go after an organisation like Get Up just because you disagree with what they do. Certainly, uh, I think that these things should be done, but they should be done right, and they should be done in a way that that's that's right and proper. And uh, certainly, I think that if Michaela Cash, you know, has pulled strings to make this happen, then it, it does look bad for the government. Although I did hear uh, Senator James Pattinson uh, today. At a Senate inquiry saying that a magistrate, in fact, granted the right to uh, raid the AWU. So, therefore, they're trying to say that there's, there's a separation of powers. It's a member of the judiciary that made the decision. It was not, in fact, um, the uh, uh, Michaela Cash. But, but certainly the momentum, the snowball was pushed down the mountain by Michaela Cash. And... It is obviously very worrying, but I think that GetUp should have their funding disclosed. And likewise, um, I think that any uh, think tank should have their funding disclosed. There shouldn't be any caps or limits on funding to political parties or think tanks. I don't think that's a liberal. But I think that all funding should be open and transparent to the public. Um, and I, I certainly do think that that is the case with GetUp. Uh, I, I have to disagree with uh, 
You, you on this because um, you know I wouldn't want uh, the Labor Party to go uh, after organisations such as the Institute of Public Public Affairs, which I know that uh, former uh, Labor MP Kelvin Thompson he wanted the the IPA's uh, donors disclosed, and the the IPA has long resisted uh, such a move. And this is why I was surprised with what you mentioned. Uh, James Patterson said, given that he used to be executive deputy director of the the IPA. I think that basically regulating any, you know, com any group that can be seen to be political and uh, you know, pu uh, putting all of these, you know, conditions on how it can operate in that. I think that's, you know, very much an overreach because, you know, what do you, you know, do you, do you just classify, say, is a, you know, local uh, clear, cl clean up, uh, you know, operation or because they might want, you know, people to, you know, recycle more, would that be classified as an associated entity? Like, where does it end? Like, I think I, often, you know, it's, it sounds good in theory that, you know, it should be transparent and that, but the, the compliance and, you know, the, the threats, threats on you if you don't comply is really quite onerous and takes away from, you know, what, what the organisation was, was first set up for. I do see the logic in that. It goes with the firearms debate as well, that we spend so much money on regulating and, and telling hunters, you know, how to keep their firearms and whatever, and we don't actually end up fighting uh, the illegal arms and drugs that come into the country. Now, that does bear some logic because we could be looking at uh, Get Up or uh, the IPA really firmly, but then we might spend all our money and resources on that and then we might, we might not be looking into kind of uh, union corruption or whatever. That might go to the wayside if our resources are, are spent all in the one location. But certainly I, I do think that uh, where the government forces these or coerces uh, these institutions uh, is probably not a great idea, but I think certainly for public knowledge, uh, voluntarily uh, disclosing uh, donors uh, might bolster public credibility. Now, it's long speculated, or it's pretty much known, that GetUp is in fact funded by George Soros, billionaire socialist, um, and the IPA has funding uh, supposedly from the likes of ExxonMobil, British American Tobacco, uh, Gina Reinhardt, and so on. So there's big money from big socialist uh, donors like George Soros, big union money going into GetUp uh, from the AWU, and there's also big government, uh, big business, sorry, uh, money going into the IPA. Now, a lot of what the IPA talks about is great, cutting regulations and so on, but there's plenty of things that are just in the benefit of big business. For instance, the Big Australia, they push Big Australia, and now that's not good for anyone or their wages or our culture. So I think that it is good to have some transparency here, uh, whether that's voluntary or the government coerces uh, big business to uh, disclose donations of over fifty or $100,000. That's another question. But certainly uh, it is interesting uh, whether it is intrinsically political or whether it's the work of the judiciary, we'll just have to wait for the facts to come out on that matter. I think if that people on the right don't like get up and its influence, they just need to get better at grassroots campaigning. I mean, stop complaining and you know try and beat get up you know on the ground and in the battle of ideas. I mean that that's the correct way to, way to do this. And it's sadly where the right has been lacking in recent years. I mean, you look at the you know if you just go to um, on election day, there's uh, there's not just uh, you know left wing political parties there. There's the unions. There's they're handing out. There's they've got heaps of tro troops on the ground. Uh, they're you know they're they're always you know launching uh, campaigns. They're very savvy on uh, social media with rallies and that. I mean the the right has hasn't done that very well. They they did do it well on one occasion. For example, when the carbon tax was brought in, there was a really good grassroots campaign on the right to which successfully defeated the carbon tax and was just a sign that you know, when the right, you know, got its act together with uh, activism, it could really achieve something. So I think that GetUp's, 
you know, a, a success. It's just a wake up call that we need to be better. Uh, or, or as Michelle Obama says, be better, be better. And, you know, I completely agree with you, Tim. We definitely need to get our act together. And uh, I know that there's been uh, a lot of uh, discussion about creating a conservative uh, version of Get Up uh, over the years, but it hasn't eventuated yet. I would in, uh, encourage you know many people on the right, please you know don't just sit there and complain. Make sure that you know you you do uh, you know take your your activism you know beyond the internet. And as we were talking to, talking about it last week, you know like Liberty Works, that's a, a new right wing activist group that you know is really needed to counter all these uh, you know uh, left wing groups such as get up well the problem is Tim here essentially in a nutshell is that people on the right have jobs and they're not on Centrelink and they don't have heaps of time on their hands and that's why we might be seen on the right as you know less politically conscious uh, because you know we focus on the day-to-day -day. we're focused on being pragmatic going to work focusing on our family and we don't essentially have as much time to uh, talk about nihilistic, neo-feminist, uh, uh, Marxist claptrap. Uh, we, we more focus on the day-to-day, -day, the pragmatic, uh, and getting things done. Uh, so that that's where I think that it might fall into a heap. But certainly, uh, I do think that there is a, a grassroots of, of university young people who have a little bit more time on their hands. I've seen this at Friedman. There were plenty of younger people there, plenty of people who have the, the passion to uh, for the activist cause of smaller government. Uh, and uh, as Ronald Reagan once famously said, as, as the size of a government uh, expands, liberty contracts. And I think that we all need to remember that through our uh, push for liberty, push for freedom, and uh, fight against the big state. Now, the federal government, yep. in their effort to try and get get up, if I can use that terminology, uh, plus the unions and Bill Shorten, uh, they've they set up a new organisation called the uh, Registered Organisations Commission to uh, look into union activity. And on the uh, at the behest of Employment Minister Michaela Cash. They uh, are conducting an investigation into money that the Australian Workers Union gave uh, way back in 2006, a $100,000 $100, donation to uh, get up when, surprise, surprise, Bill Shorten was its uh, National Secretary. So they hope that this uh, raid, and it, was, it did get approval from uh, a, a magistrate, uh, it's, um, they hoped that this would uh, embarrass uh, Bill Shorten and you know, make him look uh, dodgy. But to me, it just looked like it was an operation to get their political enemies, which I don't think is a good look in a democracy. Certainly not. It didn't look good. Not at all. Uh, but it's interesting, the, the hypocrisy of Bill Shorten donating that money, whether by personally or whether it was a, a whole board of the AWU as a collective making that decision. What does Get Up campaign for? They campaigned against coal, uh, you know, forestry, for instance, I believe. Now, they're the two biggest industries that the AWU union members uh, partake in. So, it's, it's like Bill Shorten essentially poisoning the waters for his own kind here. It doesn't make sense uh, as, as a, a union boss of, that represents a lot of miners giving $100,000 to a group that actively protests against miners and the working men and women, the blue collar uh, individuals who, you know, try and make a fair go of it. So it's once again showing Bill Shorten out to be a complete and utter hypocrite. 
But that's not really the point here. I mean, yes, we can say that, you know, the Australian Workers' Union is not making a wise choice on behalf of its members to give money to get up. But the, this is not the question here, whether, you know, it is right of the uh, federal government to, you know, be, uh, basically use the power at its disposal to, I mean, they're, they're, they're not questioning the, like, the, that it was, you know, right of this donation to take place, but whether it was properly authorised. And so they're digging up minutes from, you know, meetings 10 years ago. I mean, it, it looks uh, really, you know, desperate. And, you know, I'm, you know, obviously I agree with wh what you're saying, but I'm, you know, being objective here and it's, it's not, it's not a good look. And uh, I, I have to think that, you know, although obviously I disagree with, you know, Labour and the union movement quite a bit, they, they were quite right to, you know, get outraged about it. And in the end, it really backfired on the government because when the raids happened, the, the media were, were there to, to capture it. And so it was widely speculated at the time that the, the media were tipped off so they could, you know, capture, you know, uh, Bill Shorten's humiliation, uh, live, live on TV. And so, uh, Senate Estimates was taking place this week and Employment Minister Michaela Cash was asked whether uh, she or members of her office uh, tipped off the media about the raid and she said that uh, you know, that was not correct, although I should use her exact words. She said she was uh, very offended at, at, at the uh, accusation and it is a very serious allegation. Uh, you know, she, she, she likes to get on a high horse, uh, Michaela Cash. Uh, however, there once a media story appeared that uh, contradicted uh, that and that the media were indeed tipped off. Uh, she came back to Senate Estimates and said that uh, a staffer had tipped off the media who only told her during the uh, the dinner break that, uh, that day and the staffer had since uh, resigned. And so now Michaela Cash has misled Parliament over what looks like a politically motivated raid and it's it's completely blown up in their face and now uh, Michaela Cash, her position looks untenable. Well, I think it is really. Uh, it it is, it is pretty difficult to get one's head around this, but certainly I think that an action like this could almost cost the government uh, an election if Labor uh, weaponises it well enough. But here we look at, um, you know, uh, people betraying sources, essentially. Uh, it shouldn't be leaked by media that it was a cash, uh, you know, source. Now, that, asks, that makes me ask this question. Is this just a consequence of our moral uh, relativistic culture that, you know, morals like protecting one's sources don't matter anymore? They've just gone to the wayside. Uh, the, the erosion of Judeo-Christian values, the sources have gone to the wayside. Now, the, the only time, probably in the last 10 years, that, that I have seen uh, sources being betrayed, uh, they haven't been on the left-wing side of, you know, the sources and the information that's being, you know, there's no bombshell uh, stuff happening on the left. It's Last time it happened was with Peter Costello uh, meeting with a bunch of age reporters um, you know, prior to the 2007 election, and there was a big drop. Uh, it doesn't happen with the left because the left media establishment protects their own. So I think that, in a sense, the uh, mainstream media are uh, to blame a little bit here for blowing this up out of proportion uh, to sell papers and whatnot. But also, uh, the Michaela Cash has some ministerial responsibility. Uh, she should be grilled uh, over this. Uh, and I think that it is very troublesome. Uh, and our ministers are obviously responsible to the parliament and therefore to the people. Uh, and maybe even the governor general might have to step in here and uh, strip her ministerial post uh, if it's found that, you know, she isn't uh, capable of fulfilling this to uh, an ethical, and uh, moral level anymore. I have to disagree with you uh, that it's a breach of journalistic ethics. 
ethics. I don't think that journalists should cover for a politician who has misled Parliament. I don't think that Michaela Cash should feel that, or if she she did know about her staff, that that should you know that she should feel that she's safe because of you know um, journalistic confidentiality that she can then mislead the the Parliament because that is a pretty serious uh, offence in the the Westminster system. You you don't mislead Parliament, and I would think that a, a journalist journalist would think that it's even more of a, a greater in, in the public interest to point out when a, po a politician is misleading the parliament rather than respect uh, confidentiality. I mean, it wasn't like uh, they were, you know, respecting a source you know, revealing some, you know, massive, you know, government conspiracy. I mean, this was a, a tip-off about a police raid. You know, it's hardly, uh, it was hardly a, a noble, uh, you know, source. Uh, so, so I really have to, uh, you know, t take umbrage that, you know, somehow journalists, uh, you know, uh, betraying their profession. I think their their duty to the public to, uh, to make sure that, you know, their politicians aren't lying in Parliament. I think that's of greater concern. Well, I go back, uh, let's go back six or seven months. You, when you're at conferences, for instance, you hear a lot of buzz, a lot of credible buzz. You might even overhear politicians in conversation saying something, right? That maybe a certain leader of a, a certain uh, party might be moving to a, you know, a party that you might belong to, Tim. Now, would you disclose that information if you overheard it, someone having a private conversation, you walking past, uh, or if someone's sitting at a table with you uh, having a conversation and they let something slip, would you disclose that information or would you view that as confidential? Uh, I find this to be a fine line between public interest and journalistic credibility. Uh, it's 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 very noble to think that you know there are these you know standards of on the record, off the record, but I, I definitely am of the view that you know in reality you know there there are really no rules, and you can really you know trust you know nobody in you know uh, politics or media, and so you just have to be extra careful that the person you are you know telling this information to um, you know is going to keep it confidential, or if you are worried about people people overhearing then you move to a, to a private area so i definitely I, I definitely think that you it's you know politicians and media people need to be aware of you know where and who they're saying things to well obviously but for instance i heard that uh, i was at the conference you were at the conference i i heard out of a out of senator linehelm's mouth when i was sitting next to him uh, outside with Ross Cameron that Mark was moving to the Lib Dems. Now, two weeks later, this is page three of The Age. Um, I, I didn't go and blow my, blow my horn. I didn't find that necessary. But I guess you could delineate between, you know, that's just a triviality and then obviously misleading the parliament. And I, I think that they're, I guess you could delineate them and say that they are different things. But I certainly do think that there needs to be uh, some respect for a code of ethics and conduct uh, within any profession. And I don't like this dog-eat-dog -dog social Darwinism. I think there needs to be some respect for tradition and some respect for ethics. But I, I still think uh, blaming, you know, journalists for you getting caught out, you know, lying to Parliament, I still think that, you know, regardless of, you know, the ethics of that, you know, Michaela Cash, she has, you know, done, you know, a you know very, you know, wrong thing in our system. She's misled Parliament either because, you know, she, she didn't bother to check with her staff or she is still not being uh, completely honest because I find it very hard to believe that this staff, uh, given, given that uh, it was immediately speculated that uh, the media were tipped off, that this staffer didn't take them, uh, uh, didn't tell Michaela Cash for a whole day that they tipped the media off and the staffer uh, let uh, Michaela Cash deliberately mislead Parliament. Um, being a person of a conservative and of libertarian inclination, I understand that government in a whole generally does things pretty poorly. Uh, so I don't think you, you can attribute to malice what you can attribute to sloppiness or 
to uh, or, or just plain you know idiocy. I think we've certainly learnt that through the Trump administration. Uh, don't attribute to uh, malice what you can attribute to stupidity. I think that people can make mistakes, whether she's made a mistake or not. You know, we can't really know, I guess, until more of the facts come out. But certainly she should have had more oversight of her department. She is not uh, a walker by. That is her department. Uh, she is responsible for that. So we also need to keep that in mind. And generally when there's a problem, you cut the head off, uh, you cut the, the, the head off the snake. And I think that might have to be done here as well. Certainly, as you said, it does put our Westminster system into some disrepute. But for me, what is more interesting is, you know, uh, that the left wing media uh, will not, you know, disclose uh, knowledge of, say, Harvey Weinstein being an alleged rapist for 10 years, but they'll gladly, uh, the New York Times, but then they'll gladly, uh, you know, throw out any conservative or right wing uh, politician. But certainly, I do think that they are for their tribe. But certainly, I think that lying to Parliament is, um, you know, a, a sacrificial sin. And I don't think that she will survive. I mean, uh, I, I predicted that the day after uh, she misled Parliament, that on the Thursday, that she wouldn't last the day she did. Malcolm Turnbull uh, is uh, def uh, defending her. Uh, hopefully, uh, maybe he's thinking that this High Court decision will distract everybody, but I don't think that the Labor Party will uh, let Turnbull uh, get off that easily. And I think it's only a matter of time before, uh, you know, Michaela Cash uh, is forced to resign. I mean, she can't, you know, take the whole moral high ground with unions and, you know, their dishonesty when she has been found to, you know, be dishonest. Yes, well, you, you uh, I can't remember what the, the, the saying is exactly, but you argue with idiots and I'll beat you with experience. And I think that that's what happens when you, you stoop down to someone's level, uh, mudsling, um, get your hands dirty. Uh, the unions know what to do. That, 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 that's their game. That's what they do. And I think that Michaela Cash will either, you know, die a death of a thousand paper cuts or she'll be sacked by the Governor General or deposed by the Prime Minister before you know it. The National Broadband Network was back in the spotlight this week after a ABC Four Corners episode revealed that there'd been a 160% increase in NBN complaints to the telecommunications ombudsman, I can never say that word, and it's the, the cost of completing it has blown out to uh, $50 billion. The costs have constantly uh, blown out uh, over the years ever since it was uh, introduced under uh, Prime Minister uh, Kevin Rudd, and we also learnt that uh, NBN Co, the government-owned and operated company that's rolling out the NBN, might never turn a profit. Now, both sides have blamed each other for the, uh, the, the, the current state of the NBN, with Labor saying, well, Malcolm Turnbull, when he was a communications minister, he changed it from fibre to the premises to fibre to the node, and that's why there's these problems. And I think Malcolm Turnbull, uh, he uh, ha had the trump card on Labor saying, well, you know, if it was up to me, I wouldn't start this, you know, um, train wreck of a project to begin with, which, which is true. I mean, had, why, why would anyone think that a big government could deliver a, you know, a broadband network to, you know, the entire nation, considering, you know, how large Australia is as a continent? I mean, you know, it's just a recipe for, uh, you know, public works disaster. Have you ever uh, heard of any government program? Um, that has worked, yet alone a government monopoly that has uh, been more competitive than the private sector. Uh, the NBN uh, is, is owned by the government completely, NBN Co. Needs to be privatised immediately. Telstra was privatised and, well, you know, it's still, I believe, 40% owned by the government and it's not great, but privatise it immediately. The government controls how much internet private providers can actually buy 
to sell to their consumers, and they sell that at an exorbitant amount. So therefore, that really affects the private, uh, or well, the consumer at the end line. Uh, if private sector was involved, more funding, you know, more financial incentive, uh, the NBN, uh, like Australia Post, like any other government, uh, government-run enterprise, will fail will not do well, will be bloated, will be full with bureaucracy. You're seeing this with the NDIS now. Not only are you getting people with serious medical conditions, they probably should be on there, probably need to be on there, but you're getting people with low-level autism on there. You know, the, the, and um, that's just an example of how the government programs keep piling and piling and piling up. They're not streamlined, they're bloated, they're full of bureaucracy. This is happening with the NBN as well. And in many cases, the ADSL, uh, especially in regional areas, was performing far better than the NBN. So it's letting down consumers. It's a big hole in the wallet uh, of the taxpayer. Um, it's costing $50 billion to complete. And our internet speeds are worse in Kenya. So Kevin Dudd, tell me how this has been a success, please. Complete failure. I mean, just think of the private sector innovation that's been stifled because the government came in and said, right, we're going to, you know, rip up the, the old internet and, you know, uh, centrally build uh, a new one. Like, it's actually illegal to uh, compete against the, the NBN. And another, uh, you know, policy that was introduced related to the NBN is there's, there's now a tax on internet users to help uh, pay for the, the NBN. And... I noticed a difference during my trip to New Zealand where um, the, the New Zealand government, they, they did assist with the rollout of uh, fibre internet, but they were smart enough to partner with a, a private company. And I noticed the difference with uh, internet speeds that was much faster to upload things. Obviously, you know, we, we do this podcast, which we you know, upload to our various platforms. So it requires a lot of internet. And I've definitely noticed the, the difference in uh, New Zealand. And yeah, uh, I, with uh, running the Unshackled, I definitely uh, see, see the consequences of, you know, bad uh, internet policy over the past decade. And at the end of the day, this affects the small business owner or the, or the, or the entrepreneur like self, Tim. It makes it hard to compete in a globalised economy if one doesn't have the internet that they need to succeed. Um, now, one thing I would find interesting is uh, that, that Kenya's internet speed is a higher than, the, uh, than Australia's. And, and in fact, it is. It's... Um, 13.7 megabytes per second, uh, which is, I think it's about, uh, and the Australian internet speed is, uh, well, let me just get it up here, sorry, is uh, 10, uh, well, sorry, 13, uh, per 13.8 per second. So we've got, I believe, Kenya uh, having, you know, relatively better internet speed than Australia, which is shocking. Um, and it would be interesting to see if Kenya, uh, that enlightened uh, British colonial um, nation in the, in the west of Africa, whether they have privatised their internet. Maybe that's uh, why they've got better internet than we do in Australia. Maybe a bit of uh, your free market uh, privatisation uh, has done it for the Kenyans. But certainly we are worse than a third world country. Uh, the GDP of, of Kenya is, ew, it's about six or seven thousand per year. Uh, and it's just, it's just um, terrible that our nation uh, has, uh, you know, smaller, uh, well, so slower internet than, than Kenya. I'm uh, sorry, Kenya's GDP, apologies, is $1,500 a year. Uh, Australia's is uh, about, you know, 60. So Kenya is one of the poorest nations on earth. You know, no infrastructure, just complete, you know, de it's completely desolate besides the capital, Nairobi. We have got worse internet than Kenya. A lot of Kenyans live in mud huts, um, get around on you know, mules or what have you. We have worse internet than Kenya. This shows that uh, we are far behind the times and this shows that why we shouldn't trust government to offer us anything. 
If you want something, go out there, invest in a company and get it done yourself. Never trust big government, never trust big brother. I mean, just look at what uh, Australian governments over the past decade, the essential services they've managed to mess up. I mean, the internet, we have, you know, third world internet, and now we have uh, third world uh, electricity supply. I mean, you know, what essential service is the government going to mess up next? And we have third world migrants as well, Tim. Uh, so I think that uh, it's quite obvious what they're trying to achieve here. It's just more dependence on big government. Oh, your power bill's a bit expensive. <sighs> Get a grant from the government, you know, um, you know, so on and so forth. It, you know, it just, it's creating more government uh, dependency uh, and it's really stifling uh, our nation, our economy, our future, our prosperity. So we really need to say, hey, you know, us consumers would really appreciate some choice, uh, some free market incentive, uh, and we, we want better services, and we're not happy with the government running uh, the NBN, and we really want choice. We need choice. Um, choice and competition uh, is what leads uh, to better services for the consumer and this is self-evident and as you said before imagine imagine how many uh, free market incentives would have been uh, applied by now if it wasn't for government getting in the road I mean just think of you know what the international business community is thinking uh, about, about Australia I mean no wonder our you know manufacturing industry is leaving like we we can't manage you know the the two the two most important services in the modern age, both uh, internet and uh, electricity. I mean, and it will only get worse. I mean, we'll soon be a laughing stock. I think we already are a laughing stock, uh, Tim. Um, we and then the uh, AWU cries about manufacturers leading the nation. Oh, it's the big business, the big capitalists screwing over the workers. Get a grip of yourself. It's the high, high energy prices from government interference in the economy. It is the slow, slow internet from, guess what? A complete government monopolization of the internet. So get a grip of yourself and realize that your big government policies, your leftist utopianism has only led us down a path of destruction. So basically the takeout from our discussion this week is that uh, we've proven that government just messes up everything. I mean, they can't, they don't even know whether they're eligible for parliament, they can't even manage their offices, and they can't even manage our services. So that's probably a good, good way to end the show. Yeah, definitely. And that's why as a conservative... I push for stronger families to manage things. And you as a libertarian, you push for more individual, um, you know, responsibility. And I think that that just shows because we can't trust government. You know, we can't trust uh, the government and all politicians to tell us the truth. And that's why uh, we're the Unshackled Producers podcast every week. That's why we write articles. And that's why we would appreciate for you uh, to become a Patreon, uh, to... Uh, contribute financially so we can keep growing, so we can advertise, so we can spread the message of truth and liberty to the next generation so they don't become as brain dead as the current millennial and baby boomer gener generations that have uh, implemented this big government leviathan state that uh, tries to kill freedom at every which corner. And we'll certainly be back next week to see <laughs> oh, what, what else the government can, can stuff up. So uh, there'll, there'll probably be another crisis uh, next week. Well, you know, uh, we wouldn't be in the job if there weren't crises. But uh, certainly I want stable and secure government. But uh, we're not getting much of that under uh, Malcolm Turnbull. I, I'm honestly under a, 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 a suspicion that Malcolm Turnbull has got amnesia and he's on the wrong side of the aisle. But uh, we'll just have to wait to see whether he wakes up from this craziness or whether it keeps going on. I'll see you next week again, Jacob, and thank you once again. No worries, Tim. Uh, it was I was very happy 
uh, to be on the show once again, and I, I'm very grateful for our viewers, listeners, and readers. Thank you, take care, and have a good week. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder to check out our other podcast, Front and Centre, with Emilio Garcia, who also has a daily video news segment called What I'm Seeing Daily, so I'd also like you to check that out. The content just keeps getting pumped out at The Unshackled, so we're aiming to keep up with all the latest news. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.